Can you hear me okay? Good. It's not everyone that's put in the position of having to defend a, a Nobel Prize laureate, um, but that's where we're in the position today. As you know, Edward Snowden has been uh, nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, he's also been elected by the students at the University of Glasgow to be their rector. So it's a sort of an uh, odd circumstance to be in the position of having to defend him from the establishment here in Washington. But that's what I'm going to try to do, just to give you enough information so that you know that uh, there's another side to this, this very interesting story. Now, I'd like to begin by citing uh, those folks that uh, have really spoken out against uh, Snowden, who call him a traitor or call him a, uh, a whatever, a narcissist. Uh, you know, my definition of narcissist <laughs> doesn't fit a fellow who, who stayed out of the limelight for as, as long as he could. And um, I'd just like to uh, tell you that when uh, Colleen and I and Tom Drake and Jessalyn, Jessalyn Radek uh, when we saw Ed Snowden on the 9th of October. Uh, I don't know about the others, but my intent was to find out if this fellow was the real deal. And I came away convinced after six and a half hours of conversation with him that he was not only the most articulate, uh, the most uh, uh, serious whistleblower I had ever run into since to Daniel Ellsberg, but that he was to be taken seriously and that he was justified in his belief that finally something was going to happen. And when we see the president saying, as, you know, as my son says, when I, I'd say, I thought I told you to take out the garbage. He's always oh, just about to do that, just about to do that. Well, there was a lot of garbage in the NSA, and the president would have us believe he was just about to fix that. He was going to do that anyway, right? He's going to do that anyway. Give me a break. So what has the president said about all this? Well, he said, for example, that, uh, you know, uh, this Snowden fellow, doesn't he know that I signed an executive order? Uh, that he could have availed himself of the protection that I would, you know, doesn't he know that? Uh, he could have just uh, taken advantage of that. And, of course, the answer is uh, this executive order does not cover Edward Snowden in any meaningful way. Uh, the protection says that he must, he must go to the committees in Congress who are thoroughly complicit in all this activity, or he, he, should, uh, he should talk to the Director of National Intelligence, who on the 12th of March last year, uh, when asked, is the National Security Agency collecting any data of any kind on, a, on a millions or or hundreds of millions of, of Americans? He said, no, sir, no, sir. And you know what? That was the trigger. Snowden has said that when he saw that, when he saw the head of national intelligence lying under oath, then he decided to put in train what he intended to do. And you see that just a couple of months later that happened. James Clapper did lie under oath. Uh, his uh, successor as uh, head of the National Security Agency. Well, how shall I put this? Um, well, let me just uh, cite the facts. Uh, he said that uh, there were 54 terrorist events uh, thwarted, great word, isn't it? Thwarted by NSA collection of the kind, the bulk collection. And when he was asked again by the Senate Judiciary Committee, he said, well, uh, one, one, not 54, but just one. Um, and what was that one? That was a taxi driver in California sending $8,500 to al-Shabaab in, in Somalia. That thwarted a terrorist event. So these folks are not very good at telling the truth. And that's the important thing, because no wonder that they would come out against uh, uh, Ed Snowden for doing precisely that. I, I have to agree with the New York Times. I had a little note here about what the Times said. The very beginning of this year, I guess they were trying to make amends for uh, past transgressions. But on the 2nd of January, they said that there was enormous value of the information that Snowden revealed and the abuses that he exposed. He has done the country a great service in exposing a runaway intelligence community. Now, I spent 27 years, well, counting my Army intelligence experience, almost 30 years in this intelligence community 
in my day, it was not run away. Was it, uh, was it, did it do some abuses? Yes, but it was always because the president told him to do it. Now, how about this president? That's what I'd like to get into now. How does this president look at this? Does he, does he know what's going on? Uh, does he deliberately cover up for these people? Or does he not know? Is he being given uh, plausible deniability, which, you know, sort of a trade, uh, trade, uh, trade tactic where you don't tell the president everything so that uh, when he says it didn't happen, he's not lying. Well, I don't know what the real answer is here. I like to give him the benefit of the doubt by saying that, you know, he's only regurgitating what NSA and others are telling him. Uh, for example, the executive order. Doesn't he know that the executive order uh, would be worthless for Edward Snowden? And there's something much more important. And that is, the president has said that if we only had this bulk collection in place before 9-11, we might have been able to find out who it was in San Diego as most of you know, there were two hijackers in San Diego communicating with a terrorist base in Yemen. We might have been able to find out that other telephone number and would have been able to prevent 9-11, okay? Now, two big untruths there, okay? Guess what, folks? This may be news to you. We've been trying to s spread it around, but we need your help, okay? We did have the telephone number of the San Diego plots that the terrorists. You know, it's as easy as caller ID, folks, and you can talk to anyone in NSA who will be honest, they'll tell you the same. So the president is really not telling the truth when he said, if only we had the bulk collection thing, we could have that, that, that telephone number. It was available. There was not just one telephone conversation, as the president claimed. There were at least seven how do I know that? Because the head of the National Terrorist, Anti-Terrorist or Counter-Terrorist Center has said that, okay? And guess what? We not only had the metadata, we had the content of those telephone conversations. Why was 9-11 allowed to happen? Because NSA did not share that information outside the hallowed walls of NSA. That is fact, folks. And the person that brought that to light the person who knew that first, his name is Ed Drake, Tom Drake, sorry. Thomas Drake was subjected to four years of persecution, prosecution, after which the judge in Maryland said to those nine Department of Justice lawyers, don't you ever dare bring a case like this to me in my court again, case based on such flimsy evidence, 10 felony charges, 35 years, all charges dismissed. Now, Tom Drake knew what the deal was with respect to what NSA knew before 9-11. He was, when they thought he was a, a crony, he was a newly appointed executive. They didn't really know that he had a conscience, so they gave him the task of finding out what information was available before 9-11, and he did. And you know what they said to him? What McGinnis, the deputy director, said? She said, oh, I wish you hadn't told me that. Go on to a different job. So what we have here is a president who is saying untruthful things. And uh, I lean toward the, <laughs> toward the scarcely believable hypothesis that he is scared of these folks, that this is why when he came into office, he made it very clear that he would not pursue the torturers back where I worked. They're still walking the halls of the CIA. They're writing books. They're patting themselves on the back. And they're spying on the Oversight Committee. Hello? I think he's afraid. I think he's afraid of what might happen if he really tried to rein the security services in. And I never thought, after 50 years of watching things here in this city, that I would hear myself saying that. Now, what does that mean? Well, that sort of gives him the benefit of the doubt for, for a chance. For, in other words, if you say that he's afraid to ask the real questions and he's willing to spout the propaganda that they offer, that's real. <laughs> that's not only unfortunate, but what we need to do as a citizenry, as an educated citizenry, 
who have have access to these these data if you all are kind enough to put it in your media there's a chance that we can rise up and say mr president we like ed snowden feel real real strongly about our oath to protect and preserve and support the constitution of the united states an oath which i i swore as an army officer an oath which millions of people have sworn we take that seriously last thing i'll say is that ed snowden had a copy of the constitution on his desk in Hawaii. And his coworkers have said, in a Forbes magazine article, have said he used to whip that out and he used to argue with us because what, what he was asking was, can what we are doing be consonant with the Fourth Amendment? Now, the smart people say that NSA means uh, no such amendment anymore. And General Hayden, who used to head up the CIA, says that uh, the Fourth Amendment does not include probable cause. But in finishing, I think it's really important just to think about what the Fourth Amendment is because it's very small and it's very succinct and it's very, very clear. The right of the people to be secured in their persons, their houses, their, their papers and their effects shall not be violated and no Warrant shall issue except upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the places to be searched and the people or objects to be seized, period, end quote. There is no way, there is no way that bulk collection of our emails, of our telephone calls, or whatever else can be square with that amendment. If they change the name of NSA to no such amendment, we have to change it back. Thank you.